Hello and welcome back to Japan Memo, the IISS Japan Tour program podcast where we are joined by experts, strategists, and practitioners to unpack why Japan matters in today's regional and global geopolitical landscape. I'm Yuka Koshino, IISS Research Fellow for Security and Technology Policy, and I'll be your host for this episode. Today, we're delighted to welcome Professor Akiyama Nobumasa and William Albert to gain their insights and expertise on Japan's approaches to nuclear nonproliferation and deterrence in the Indo Pacific region. Akiyama Sensei is Dean of the School of International and Public Policy and Professor at the Graduate School of Law at Hitotsubashi University and Adjunct Research Fellow at the Japan Institute of International Affairs. He is a member of the International Group of Eminent Persons for a World Without Nuclear Weapons, which was established after Prime Minister Kishida's policy speech in January 2022. He is also advisor to the Japanese delegation to the NPT Review Conferences since 2000 and previously served as Minister Counselor at the Permanent Mission of Japan to the international organizations in Vienna and Special Advisor to the Ambassador on Nuclear Security. William is Director of Strategy, Technology, and Arms Control here at the IISS. He previously served as the Director of NATO's Arms Control, Disarmament, and Weapons of Mass Destruction Nonproliferation Center, ACDC, from 2017 to 2020. He has more than 25 years of experience in arms control, disarmament, and nonproliferation, with a background in international diplomacy related to arms control and nonproliferation. Thank you very much both for being here to analyze a timely, complex issue, which is also a priority agenda under the Kishida administration. So, before jumping in into analysis of Japan's approaches to nuclear nonproliferation and deterrence, I think it's important to provide our listeners with an overview of the current nuclear threat environment in the Indo Pacific region to contextualize today's discussion. Akiyama sensei, could I first ask you to sketch out the major nuclear threats surrounding Japan? And broader Indo Pacific region, and most importantly, how the environment has evolved over the past decade or in recent years. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation to the podcast. And I'm glad to be with my friend,、uh, William, on this important topic. My assessment of the security environment surrounding Japan is rather more pessimistic than ever. First, China has been constantly and rapidly developing its nuclear and conventional arsenal. And in particular, the American intelligence found that several hundreds of silos for the ICBM were built in the Xinjiang province. They are now upgrading various types of missiles. The prospect is that China is going to further expand their stockpile of nuclear warheads. So the Chinese nuclear capability is even greater than rapidly catching up with the United States. When we look around at the Korean Peninsula, I think the North Korean kind of activities to further build up its nuclear capacity capability is also a serious concern. North Korea has Been conducting a series of missile tests. I don't think we should call them tests. It's kind of all a practice or exercise, a drill to operationalize their missile launch capabilities. North Korea said it's going to develop the maneuverable tactical nuclear capabilities. That means they are going to employ nuclear weapons in a war fighting in the Korean Peninsula. North Korea is not prepared to have full spectrum of nuclear capabilities. So that poses serious threats to Japan. And of course, we shouldn't forget about Russia. The threats make our security environment seriously damaged. Our security is eroding. Also, I think I should mention that I think Russia is probably supporting North Korean missile programs as well. If we look at the success rate of a North Korean missile test, I think it's been significantly improving. It's by their own effort, but at the same time, I think there may be some technical collaborations between Russia and North Korea. Thank you very much for that very helpful overview, Akiyama Sensei. William, any response to Akiyama Sensei's views? And also, when talking about responding to nuclear threats, it is critical to understand the perceptions and intentions of actors to mitigate risks and miscalculation. In your view, what are the often overlooked aspects and dynamics of the current nuclear issues in the region? Akiyama san touched on something that I thought was really interesting the Russian aspect. Russia has been flying long range aircraft around Japan, around the Big Island,、uh, since at least 2014. Most recently, they flew nuclear capable Tu 95 bombers on the 21st of March, 2023, 
which happened to coincide with PM Kashida's visit to Ukraine. These air incursions also joint bomber flights with China. Starting in about July 2019, they've been flying regular heavy bomber flights, China, Russia, joint heavy bomber flights, which in 2019 was the first time ever. This has been a regular feature now in the region, and they usually often coordinate their overflights over disputed islands, either in the South China Sea or islands that are in dispute between Japan and other countries uh, to heighten tensions. They also conduct joint exercises. Uh, China has participated in Russia's massive a Vostok exercise, which happens every four years in the Far East. It is a really dangerous situation. The other thing that people overlook a little bit is Sino-Russian nuclear cooperation. We know that, for instance, Russia has been working with China on its plutonium reactors for quite some time. This year, they're delivering 550 kilograms of highly enriched uranium to help China jumpstart its plutonium fast breeder reactor program. This program, if used by China towards nuclear weapons, can create dozens and dozens of warheads worth of plutonium per year. And the Russian cooperation here is especially notable. Also, how will India react to China's buildup? India will undoubtedly start to build up their arsenal. They consider China to be their number one threat. That will then have further effects on Pakistan, who will react to India's nuclear program. It's this sort of hub and spoke relationship of deterrence relationships where Russia and China are cooperating more and more and creating a, a series of unstable dyads across the region. So it's, it's, it's very interesting. And then the other confusing element was the March 21st statement between uh, President Xi and President Putin on the inadmissibility of nuclear weapons on other countries' territories. I completely understand why China is very concerned with that, because as all these developments have occurred, the desire by Japan and South Korea for a more visible demonstration of American extended deterrence guarantees in the region has skyrocketed. And then Putin on the 25th of March seemed to reverse himself and declare that he's going to put nuclear weapons in Belarus. I'm very curious to hear what President Xi's reaction to that would be, that Putin would do this four days after a joint statement on saying that something like that would be inadmissible. It's a very confusing situation. And it also, I think, you know, is going to feed the debate even further in South Korea, where there's a real demand for more extended deterrence guarantees, where there's a real concern, as Akiyama-san pointed out, because of North Korea's moves towards thinking about nuclear weapons as a battlefield tool and not just as a deterrent tool or as a way to interdict U.S. intervention. This is all very, very concerning. And I, and I do wonder what President Xi thinks about President Putin's reversal. Thank you very much for those comments. I think we'll get to the extended deterrence questions in a bit, but I think it was really helpful to understand that Japan is on the front line of the states with nuclear capabilities, China, North Korea, and Russia, but also the dynamics is evolving really quickly, especially in the context of recent cooperation between Russia and China. So I think I would like to ask the questions around Kishida government's response to this more pessimistic environment. So Akiyama-sensei, how is the administration responding to this situation? Kishida-san is elected from the one of the constituencies in Hiroshima, and he said that nuclear disarmament is his life work. When he took an office, uh, many people thought that he would be promoting the nuclear disarmament. He is going to chair as a president of the G7 and uh, the summit meeting in Hiroshima. Many thought that the nuclear disarmament is naturally uh, one of the top agenda of the G7 summit meeting. However, the Russian invasion in Ukraine changed that kind of entire picture and his game plan, I think. He is well aware of the seriousness of the security environment and the implication of the Russian invasion in Ukraine. In particular, Russia used the threat of use of nuclear weapons to further carry out its conventional operations. That means that long nuclear shadow is pretty much critical in conducting the war and that is a great reminder for the Japanese public how our neighborhood, the big neighbor with the nuclear weapons, may act assertively against non-nuclear weapons neighborhood. Responding to that kind of uh, situation, I think Mr. Kishida and his government prioritize to strengthen the extended deterrence uh, rather than uh, promoting a nuclear disarmament. To me, it's unfortunate that he has to kind of set back his agenda on nuclear disarmament. It's uh, totally understandable that he has to prioritize to strengthen 
Japan's own uh, capability at the same time to strengthen alliance coordination with the United States and other partners in the region. Thank you, Akiyama-sensei. And as William has already pointed out, as the nuclear weapons climate worsens, the credibility of extended deterrence also arose, and countries like South Korea that we previously mentioned, but also Japan, uh, worry about their security. So while the nuclear sharing debate came to be addressed in Japan, President Yoon of South Korea went even further, indicating the possibility of South Korea producing and possessing its own nuclear weapons, a statement which gained popular support from the public as well. Akiyama-sensei, how do you see the debates over the credibility of the extended deterrence? The three days after the invasion by Russia into Ukraine, former Prime Minister Abe mentioned the possibility of nuclear sharing in the TV program. That was echoed by the other politicians that maybe Japan should consider the sharing of nuclear weapons with the United States. That is a symbolic of how the Japanese public and people are quite sensitive about the credibility of the extended nuclear deterrence provided by the United States. But at the same time, I think the debate goes with the involvement of uh, uh, the security experts whether nuclear sharing would make a difference from the current arrangement of extended nuclear deterrence. Because our concern is the assertiveness of the U.S. commitment to the use of nuclear weapons when Japan was attacked by major nuclear powers or something. In that case, U.S. decision matters. And as long as U.S. decision is involved, then I think the credibility question remains the same, whether it is nuclear de- extended deterrence or the nuclear sharing. Instead of pursuing the nuclear sharing, the many uh, security experts in Japan thought that it would be more rational and uh, practical to uh, seek the opportunities and also make possibilities to further strengthen the, the extended deterrence and make a better arrangement of the joint planning and coordination in the military operations between two allies. William, how worried are you about the credibility of the extended deterrence? And do you think nuclear sharing will impact Japan's deterrence capability, as well as the dynamics of non-proliferation, arms control and disarmament in the region? It is a huge concern in Japan and in South Korea. I think South Korea has more of an acute fear and also less of the inhibition that Japan has in terms of actual possession of nuclear weapons. Clearly, President Yoon felt comfortable saying uh, what he said. But that also comes from a series of conversations that the U.S. and South Korea have had on extended deterrence. There's a forum under the special consultative mechanism that the two countries have on nuclear consultation. They had their annual meeting back in November. The U.S. made a lot of promises towards improving extended deterrence, not just for South Korea, but in the region. Japan and the U.S. also meet regularly to talk about deterrence issues, including Japan-U.S. 2 plus 2 Security Consultative Committee, That meets annually at the minister level, Minister of Defense, Minister of Foreign Affairs with the SECDEF and SEC state. They met back in January. And then there's the U.S.-Japan Extended Deterrence Dialogue, which started back in 2010 and involves lower level DOD state, uh, MOD and MFA members talking. They met back in November. The U.S. has also put a lot of emphasis on trilateral talks, trying to get Japan and South Korea to work together more on security threats. Uh, including the defense trilateral talks, which are meeting here in D.C. on the 14th of April, the trilateral ministerial meeting, which met back in February 2023 and has had a number of leader-level statements back in Phnom Penh. So there's a lot of emphasis on working bilaterally with the Japanese to improve their understanding and their faith and their confidence in U.S. extended deterrence, uh, as well as trilateral work to, to get the Japanese and South Koreans to work more closely with the United States on these issues. It's been a real hallmark of the Biden administration to try to move away from a transactional relationship with these countries and move towards more of a full partnership. And I would say that Japan has done tremendous work inside their government in coordinating better, in understanding more what extended deterrence means. I have full respect for their decisions. And when you look at a nuclear sharing arrangement, it makes a little bit less sense for Japan. It made more sense in the Cold War in Europe because you were talking about U.S. forces and German, West German forces cheek to jowl right on the front line. And so the need for 
the West Germans to be involved in not only deterrence planning, but actual using the weapons in wartime was very important. With Japan, it's just not as clear how that would work. Would we base nuclear weapons in Japan for Japanese pilots to fly? It, there's a lot of interim steps that would happen there. And it is, uh, just as Nobu said, really unclear as to what that would add exactly to extended deterrence. But the whole point of the extended term guarantee by the United States is to convince South Korea and Japan not to pursue nuclear weapons. I think, as I mentioned, that decision is much more mature and entrenched in Japan, in South Korea less so. And so there, there has to be a lot more work with South Korea to make sure that they understand that they do not need to make their own independent nuclear weapons. They made an effort for that in the, in the late 70s, early 80s, which the United States was very displeased about. There clearly needs to be a, a consistent engagement with South Korea to ensure that they rely on U.S. extended deterrence. Uh, because if South Korea or Japan or Saudi Arabia or any of the countries with a defense relationship with the United States decides to build nuclear weapons, that could have a chain effect that erodes confidence in U.S. extended deterrence guarantees and promotes proliferation around the world, which would be dangerous. It is a key U.S. priority to use extended deterrence to prevent allies from seeking nuclear weapons, to convince them not to do so. I think in particular for Japan, it is important to discuss thoroughly with the United States about possibility of joint operation planning, even in the uh, nuclear contingencies. And that probably increased the credibility of U.S. commitment to the extended deterrence. And of course, uh, Japan would like to know what kind of role Japan would play if the, in any contingency happened either in on over Taiwan Strait or on the Korean Peninsula. Either way, I think Japan inevitably will be involved in the operation, particularly in uh, supporting U.S. operation from the rear. And in that case, if we're going to fight a uh, war and the long nuclear shadow casted by uh, China or uh, North Korea, then of course nuclear elements. Inevitably, the issues that we have to really consider in terms of how we're going to work together and what will be the Japan's role to play in such a, a situation, a scenario, to increase the credibility of the alliance itself and also the extended deterrence. I think we also need to deepen that kind of exercise, just go beyond the kind of nuclear tourism, which is sometimes sarcastically told among the participants of the extended deterrence dialogue. Thank you very much. That's a very key word, nuclear tourism. Um, but I think that was really helpful to understand how to strengthen the credibility of the extended deterrence and how the nuclear sharing argument might be different from Europe and the Asian context. Nuclear non-proliferation arms control and disarmament have been Kishida government's priority agenda, as Akiyama-sensei laid out in the beginning, and the focus is particularly timely as Russia suspended the 2010 New Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, New START, between the U.S. in February. We also see weapons development advances in China, North Korea, and Iran, and Russia threatens the use of tactical nuclear weapons and their deployment to Belarus, as William mentioned. So Akiyama-sensei, what diplomatic, economic, and military tools are available for Japan to promote nuclear non-proliferation and arms control? How should Japan combine these available tools to help its efforts in achieving a nuclear-free world? You pose me a very, very difficult question. <laughs> when we talk about the nuclear politics or nuclear diplomacy, most important asset is maybe nuclear arsenal which Japan doesn't possess. We should accept it as a reality. I don't think Japan should change this kind of endowment. So it's a given factor for Japan. Having said so, I think Japan should mobilize their resources in diplomacy in the multilateral arenas, including NPT, review conferences, United Nations. But on top of that, I think we should work with like-minded countries, including United States, UK, and European partners, in strengthening our non-proliferation efforts. In particular, now we witness the uh, so-called entanglement of conventional and nuclear, as well as so-called new domains of various assets, various capabilities uh, entangled each other. Our strategic calculation or our equilibrium for the stability becomes even more complicated than before. That suggests that technology matters. So we have to really work on how to regulate the, the transfer of technology in order to avoid such a technology will be falling into the wrong hands. Non-proliferation is one of the top priorities. But the, what I've seen is now, I think we are still struggling. What 
kind of effective measures we can take. Definitely, we have to have a more strategic dialogues and deepen our sort of understanding on the common interest and even with the understanding of differences of priorities so that we have more coordinated and cohesive approach to the, the prevention of the proliferation of technologies and uh, sensitive technologies which could be used for development of critical strategic weapons. Thank you. William, um, so Japan holds this year's G7 presidency and is a non-permanent member of the UN Security Council until 2024. How could Japan leverage um, multilateral frameworks such as these and the NPT to promote non-proliferation and arms control? I have to agree entirely with uh, Akiyama-san on what he said. It, it's This is a really challenging moment to be advocating for disarmament. It almost feels like we are back to a world before the Cuban Missile Crisis, where the Russians and the Chinese both seem to want to weaponize risk. They want to use intimidation and threats. They are happy to escalate in crises and to use nuclear rhetoric to achieve their aims. And in that circumstance, it's very hard to find common agreement to address nonproliferation threats. I absolutely agree on new technologies anywhere where we can find agreement. I mean, if we can get the Russians and the Chinese to work positively towards building rules and norms on behavior in outer space, that can have a huge stabilizing influence because of the entanglement between nuclear and conventional command and control in outer space, the chances of a space conflict escalating or conflict in space escalating a conflict on Earth beyond our control is very, very high. The previous Russian and Chinese proposals on prevention of placement of weapons in outer space are, are deeply cynical, whereas the current effort going on in the open-ended working group in the UN is, is much more responsible. So if we see Russia and China engaging in that process, then I think we're doing very well. But in the meantime, just because they're not engaging positively doesn't mean that we shouldn't still push for rules and norms towards non-proliferation, towards preventing the spread of the most dangerous weapons. We just have to acknowledge that that previous cooperation in the P5 is much reduced and the chances for real breakthroughs are low. So Japan, I think, as, as a responsible power, can foster rational dialogues and can look for the places where cooperation is possible, while at the same time working with like-minded states on what responsible nuclear behaviors can be, for instance, reducing risks of conflict, all these kinds of things. There's a lot of good work that can be done, but it has to be through the lens of a diminished expectation that Russia and China will engage in any serious or meaningful way, at least in the short term. I hate to think that it would take a crisis like the Cuban Missile Crisis to snap Russia and China out of their miasma, and China in particular, that has no limitations, not even a self-imposed restraint on the production of fissile material for nuclear weapons or on its nuclear warhead totals. I would hope at some point they're going to engage and talk about restraint and talk about transparency instead of just saying, well, we have no first use, so we don't need to talk about anything else. I would like to actually ask a question to William. I thought that the nuclear strategies or other nuclear policies are the subset of greater strategy. I don't want to use grand strategy, the phrase, but I must say, to put it simply, I think nuclear policies are a subset of a grand strategy. And that is the missing piece or the kind of missing part of the U.S., policy on the side of a nuclear non-proliferation. So if we look at the Middle East, we witness very significant change of the tide there. Saudi Arabia and Iran are making rapprochement. I don't know if it's a genuine one or simply a kind of marriage of convenience, but still this kind of change of the relationship might cause further risk of proliferation. For example, there may be a mutual recognition of uh, respective uh, fuel cycle programs. In the past, you know, Saudi Arabia was strongly opposing Iranians possessing nuclear fuel cycle, but when their relationship further improve, then they might acknowledge their wishes to possess nuclear fuel cycle. That's against the U.S. interest, our interest. So we need a grand strategy to deal with such a situation. Now, some people said that China is doing better and China is less concerned about proliferation and rather they are more interested in strategic maneuvering and trying to increase its own stake rather than thinking about the international order. I think I would like to ask William, what would be the, our game plan to change the course? 
I think that's a great question, and I wish I could point to a game plan, but I think you're absolutely right. We've taken things like, okay, so we have the nuclear supplier group, it sits over here. We have the IAEA, it sits over here. We have nuclear deterrence dialogues, they sit over here. Especially in the US government, these things are so split that no one is taking them all and looking at them together in any kind of comprehensive way. And that's just within the United States, because the United States isn't the biggest supplier or owner of the technology for enrichment, for instance. So you would need a new bargain among the nuclear capable states, nuclear power capable states, joined with the discussion on deterrence and nonproliferation, all in a coordinated way to say, we all have an interest in there being fewer and not more nuclear weapon states. We all have an interest in greater and not lesser controls over all the tools that can enable you to get to the point where you can make nuclear weapons. But instead, commercial interests or narrow national interests are superseding, as you were loath to call it, sort of a grand strategy on nonproliferation. It was the Kennedy administration. It was President John F. Kennedy who was so afraid that he would leave to the next president 20 to 25 nuclear weapon states. And so his solution for that was to use extended deterrence guarantees and the NPT as two tools to try to manage the spread of nuclear weapons. And the Soviets were not on board, actually until the Chinese nuclear test in 64, when the US started sharing information about other nuclear weapons programs, including Sweden and Switzerland. Then the Russians realized, wait a second, this is a common problem that the US and the Soviet Union have, and we need to address this together. So is there a way to get the US and Russia and China and the other key nuclear technology states like Japan and France <laughs> to work together to say, no, we need a much broader strategy. This can't be narrow commercial interests. This is not about you know, who's selling what enrichment technology to whom. This is about, are we looking at this in the grander scheme of things and saying, who is trying to build a hedge towards nuclear weapons in the future, and how can we prevent that? Is there a way we can do that through the IEA? Is there a way that we can develop a common strategy? You saw how hard it was for the Obama administration in the nuclear security summits to manage HEU and plutonium. This is an even bigger ask. I think it's absolutely vital, and I think you've touched upon something that really needs, I think, more work and attention. What would that look like? And how would you work together in that way? And what would be the organizations? Would you need a different alignment of organizations? Would you need to have different types of conversations in the NSG, for instance? Would you need to bring security policy directors into some of these export control regimes to say, wait a second, this isn't, this isn't about dollars and cents. This is about something much, much bigger. But I do think that's a, an absolutely brilliant and visionary way of looking at this. We need to take a step back and say, where are the vulnerable points in the spread of nuclear weapons? What are all the tools that we have to address this? And are the right countries at the table to talk together and work together to prevent the further spread of nuclear weapons? I like the, uh, your concept of grand strategy for non-proliferation. And I thought that it is important for us to think the nuclear deterrence, arms control, disarmament, and the non-proliferation in a package um, a fashion. So we need an integrated approach. And we have a, a common approach among like-minded countries, including United States, UK, U Japan, maybe Australia, and European countries, and think about how we cohesively think and uh, deal with the challenges, whatever the challenge would be. For example, the threats from nuclear neighbors or a proliferation risks, thinking about engaging so-called the global south as well. And the other part of that has to be export controls, especially in the United States, but not only in the United States. Export control is considered part of your trade ministry or something like that. And that always blows me away because, as you mentioned before, not just nuclear, but other technologies. If we're only looking at sales, if we're only looking at competitive advantage, then we're missing the security dimension of this. And so we could stumble into a situation, we've seen it many times, you and I have seen this many times, where an export control decision overrides a national security decision because there's national advantage to be had or industry advantage to be had. And so all those elements that you spoke about, you, I think you also have to plug in export controls because we need a coherent policy that controls the most dangerous technologies and has a real forward-looking future-minded eye because we may inadvertently stumble into a situation where we're competing in a new technology that we had no idea had a huge defense implication that undermines stability and security all over the world. I totally agree. 
Thank you very much for that. I think um, the, the biggest takeaway and great conclusion to, to this debate about that we need a coherent policy and we need a holistic package, including deterrence, peace, but non-proliferation and export control to deal with these challenges. I have a final question to William. Regional nuclear security issues will likely be on the agenda at this year's 2023 Shangri-La Dialogue that we host. And for those who don't know, the Shangri-La Dialogue is the Indo-Pacific's preeminent regional security meeting where ministers debate the region's most pressing security challenges and engage in important bilateral or trilateral plurilateral talks. So William, given the importance of the dialogue for peace and security in the region, what discussions do you expect to take place there on nuclear security issues and what might be the outcomes? For the first time, I think ever, we're having a dedicated session on nuclear weapons, proliferation policy, threats, deterrence, all this bringing together uh, ministers from different countries and the IAEA director general and some really heavy hitters to to have a, a deep conversation on this topic. This is one of those topics that when I first came to WIWS two years ago, I really wanted on the agenda. And a lot of people said, well, no, look, you, you don't understand in this region, it's not really you know, seen as a, the right kind of topic to address, not just North Korean developments or Chinese developments or the Ukraine war or Russia's actions, but all of these things together have, I think, convinced more and more people that this is not just some debate that happens between the US and Russia or among the P5. This is a debate on security, on stability that everyone has a stake in. And Shangri-La has to engage on this topic. And the fact that James Crabtree has indulged me and allowed this on the agenda, I think is a huge step forward. We had our Sherpa meeting in January where we tested it out and saw how it went. Dialogue was extraordinary. And there were representatives from countries like Indonesia and Cambodia and Vietnam who were coming over to me and saying, this is excellent. I'm so glad this was on the agenda, which really proves that we can have a mature debate about deterrence, about nuclear weapons, in the region that there is a desire for it and that we can hear from more voices. We can hear from voices in the region. What are they concerned about? Are they concerned and how can they help with our mutual concerns to avoid nuclear war, to avoid further nuclear proliferation, uh, to ensure the peace and stability across the region all at the same time while confronting the, the most deadly threats in the world. So I'm very excited. I think this is going to be a great debate. I'm glad to be part of it and I'm grateful that it's finally on the agenda at Shangri-La. Thank you, William. We're approaching the very end of um, this podcast episode, very rich one and with lots of details and perspectives. We want to ask you two Japan Memo questions. Do you have a book recommendations for listeners who wish to understand Japan? I have one book written by the fellow of uh, WIWS, uh, Mark Fitzpatrick. The title is Asia's Latent Nuclear Powers. He analyzes Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan, how the states are possessing latent nuclear capabilities and refraining from uh, materializing that capability into the weapons. As we discussed, there is a trend that the nuclear weapons uh, play more critical role and um, even sometimes decisive role. It may be natural for some states to consider the possibility of uh, seeking nuclear options. Maybe it's nice to come back how this latent capability possessed, acquired by the East Asian uh, you know, players. So that's why I suggest this book. The Actually, another book written in Japanese, in Japanese said, Showa Shikogi. It's a lectures on uh, history of Showa era. This is edited by a very prominent historian. And in fact, I contributed a chapter on the history of Japan's nuclear policy, how it started after the war, talking about three non-nuclear principles and dilemmas of pursuing both nuclear disarmament and extended deterrence and so forth. Not only my chapters, but other chapters covers a lot of interesting policy issues. So if you are able to command the Japanese language, I would like to recommend this book. I'm going to recommend a book and a movie. So for the book, I would say uh, Haruki Murakami's Underground, The Tokyo Gas Attack and the Japanese Psyche. For me, an incredibly formative book in my understanding of Japanese culture, especially as it relates to weapons of mass destruction. We're so used to thinking about Japan through the nuclear lens, but looking at, I mean, here's a country 
where one of the most horrific chemical weapons terrorist attacks in history occurred, the U.S. language version of the book combines subsequent interviews that were done with the perpetrators of the attack that's published in Japan under the name The Place That Was Promised. It also cuts down from 60 interviews with victims to about 34 interviews with victims. So the book is extraordinary. It looks at the attack from the victim's point of view. It looks at the attack from the perpetrator's point of view, and then it has this incredible essay by Murakami, this incredible viewpoint on how Japan looks at victimhood and perpetrators of attacks. And it truly opened my eyes to just a completely different cultural understanding of weapons of mass destruction and how a society deals with these kinds of attacks and how they look at responsibility and individual responsibility. Just truly amazing. A film that uh, was actually uh, recommended to me a couple of years ago, uh, which I immediately hunted down, called uh, Shin Gojira, 2016 film by Hideaki Anno and Shinji uh, Higuchi. It's an extraordinarily detailed film about the bureaucratic response to Godzilla attack. And it's really extraordinary. Now, I used to work on what we call in the United States the Nuclear Accident Response Plan. So I would go to different U.S. nuclear bases across the United States and see what would happen if there were an accident or incident and how they work with local authorities. So for me to watch Shin Gojira and see what are really excellent procedures in place, but see how bureaucracy can strangle uh, an effective response and how an over-deference to chain of command and lack of flexible thinking can cost lives, which is really important lesson, no matter how great your equipment, no matter how shiny your equipment is, no matter how great looking your training procedures are, if you're not ready for the complexities of a disaster, it can have horrible, horrible effects. So yeah, I thought that was a, an incredible spin on the traditional Godzilla film to turn it back, at least for the first three quarters of the film, on the bureaucracy itself and to see how Japan responds to these kinds of disasters, which also explains the different earthquake disasters, the different nuclear disasters that have occurred, and the sometimes, from the outside, just perplexing response. We think of Japan as being so incredibly organized and so technologically advanced, but the response to some of these disasters has just been perplexing. And so I think this film really sort of starkly illustrated to me some of the, the issues and why they exist, and did so in a, a very entertaining and engaging way. It reminded me of what my friend said to me. And he was invited to the prime minister's office when the earthquake happened in 2011 as an expert of crisis management after he returns from the prime minister's office. He said, I was invited in order to help the crisis management, but what I did was just to observe management crisis. <laughs> <laughs> Very interesting. So final question, what do you think people often get wrong about Japan? Many people thought that Japan might go nuclear easily, but I think Japanese public opinion is rather pretty resilient. So I conducted actually public survey online in January this year. This result showed the more than 80% of the Japanese said the world should abolish nuclear weapons eventually. And also more than half said, even if neighbors are going nuclear, Japan should not seek nuclear weapons. Many people say that kind of from the, coming from the legacy of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, this is more a rational calculation which would be better for our security rather than simply you know, thinking about Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So that's something that I would like to emphasize. I was just speaking with a journalist earlier today on this very topic, and it was remarkable. He had just sort of realized that Japan has had its own version of what the Germans called the Zeitenwende, or the turning point on their defense. They're going to increase their defense spending to become the third largest defense spender in the world. They've been changing the constitution so that they can better defend themselves. They've been looking at deep strike options, missiles, and advanced conventional options across the board. People miss the fact we're so focused on what's happening in Europe, or if we look at Asia, we look at China, we look at South Korea, we forget that Japan is an important player on defense policy and the decisions they make will have an impact across the region. And we need Japan to think strategically and to think more broadly and to engage on the hardest security policies in the world. And they are doing so. And I've been so impressed through my career at the extraordinary Japanese diplomats I've had the opportunity to work with and Japanese experts 
like Nobu, it's just, it's been such a joy. We, we tend to think of Japan only in the West, only through the lens of disarmament. And we forget that they are just an incredible player here, an incredible partner to the United States, an incredible partner to the West and to NATO. And Europe needs to engage more with Japan to develop a common understanding of global threats and regional threats and how they can work together and their shared values. I think it's much more important for them to understand that and to engage more deeply and uh, in a higher profile way. China will always be important, but I would love to see Macron have made a similar visit to Japan and to talk with the Japanese about the importance of their society and their role in the region rather than just buttering up President Xi. Thank you, William and Akiyama-sensei, and thank you to our listeners for joining us on another episode of Japan Memo. If you enjoyed this episode, we urge you to subscribe to Japan Memo on the podcast platform of your choice. For more insightful analysis, I also encourage you to look at past research by the Japan Trip Program and the IISS on our website. We also hope to connect with you on Twitter, where we are actively sharing the latest news and analysis on everything Japanese, geopolitics, and more. You can find me at at Yuka Koshino and Akiyama Sensei at at Nobu underbar Akiyama and William at at W Alberk. Thanks again and see you next time.